Hey guys, it's Matt. Once every four, five, or six weeks, I take my half page understanding of reality and I expand it out into a large presentation. And it's interesting, every time I do it, the presentation seems to get longer and longer. And that's not because of the half page, which I've never actually read the exact half page. The half page doesn't get any lo lo longer and it changes a bit. But I think it gets longer this presentation because our understanding of each component is getting a little bit better. And yes, I could present the half page and probably a third of you would understand it. But again, the Amish classroom approach, everybody needs help in different areas. And this isn't all from me. Uh, I have insights and I come up with certain things from time to time. But I've said this before, guys, I'm a, a disseminator. It, the information that comes into me from the smartest people in this place we call Earth, it, every bit of it helps me refine my understanding of this or that. And then I work it back into the half page and then work that back out into the expanded presentation of what is reality. And it's just little stuff like, you know, not trying to shoot for anything big, like what is reality and what is our role in this reality as, quote, human beings, their term, not ours, living our lives. Just little stuff like that. About of the same importance as a Teletubbies episode. Okay, the half page expanded March of 2022. If you can believe that, I can't. This is the Earth life. We don't know how we got here exactly. But in the end, how does one measure success? Just think how warped the metrics and viewpoints of how you measure success in life, how warped it would be for most of the people that have fully participated in what is called society how lost they are. At least a few of us would be smart enough to weigh what are called spiritual gains over what this material plane has to offer in terms of its metrics for success. The workers in the Apple TV show Severance are rewarded with waffle parties. Unfortunately, most of the people around us don't really ask for much more when you back up far enough and look down. If you back up far enough and look down at the rewards they're asking from this material plane of existence, it, it just looks like waffle parties. Fortunately, we are looking for something a little bit more. So for the few of us who still care about the other side of the coin, how does one measure success here in terms of progress of spirit? I think what follows is the best place to start. It has to do with perspective and the perspective that you carry with you as you live your life day by day. Do we have the proper evolution and advancement of life perspective? This, to me, is spiritually winning. Perspective number one. Do you see yourself as a human being living life who is desperately trying to find his spiritual side? Oh, if I read this book, this will give me something. Or I'm trying to find myself, and it's always looking, 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 looking. Where should I look? What guru can I listen to so I can find it? Looky, looky, look. Okay, that's number one. Most people, us, for most of our lives, maybe all of us now. But what's key is perspective number two. When you walk out your door going to the Lumen Corporation in the Apple TV show Severance before they mind wipe you, are you, do you carry yourself as a timeless spiritual entity having an experience here during this human train stop? I mean, the perspectives are so simple, but what do we do? We're always stuck in number one. Why can't we carry ourselves truly knowing we are number two? Now, we've all heard this before. Spiritual entity, timeless, always has been, always will be in a human embodied experience. We've heard it. Yeah, we heard it. But the point of this is, is not to reiterate that to you. The point is, what is your truly your perspective as you push open the double doors at Walmart? Well, I guess they it's it's touchless. They slide. You just wave your hand and they open. But what is your perspective as you walk through the aisle of the Walmart aisle looking for your uh, preserves and grape jelly with the spandex, people with the spandex walking all around you. What is your perspective? You know, most of us are stuck in perspective number one. You know, oh, I, I, can Matt help me find myself? Can this guru help me find myself? Well, you can, uh, Matt might be able to share. Why am I talking about myself again in third person? Matt may be able to share some insights from time to time, but that doesn't, and somebody else might, and somebody other channel might, or whatever you read or the Tibetan Book of the Dead, or the Emerald Tablets of Toth, but that doesn't mean right now 
you have the ability to carry yourself from that other perspective. And how many of us are actually doing it? Now, when it happens, and am I there? No. I, I, I work on this. I need to work on this. Most of us do. When it happens, I call it a spiritual pole shift. All this talk about pole shift. I don't know why this has popped into my head as I wrote this, but all this talk about pole shift related to cataclysm, maybe the pole shift is a shift in our own perspective. And, and you know, you can look at some of the stuff that comes through the truth community that's planted in the truth community. Oh, pole shift is coming. We're all going to die. Oh, okay, take it. What does it really mean? To me, and this, I'm going to use it right now as a shift in perspective. Almost everybody is stuck in number one. Number one is just a first person, is, is the life we're living now. I don't have to explain it to you. You're, you're living it. I'm living it. It's a first person video game looking out through human eyes, lost, trying to find himself or herself and sp spiritual practice and meditation and reading this book and watching this channel. It's a first person video game and somebody's right in the middle of the Sims game and they believe every bit of it. Number two is more of a third person perspective. You still have to look out through, through your eyes and the human experience, but it's more of a third person perspective, number two. Like, keep remembering, looking down on this human experience from and the aspect of you, as, as close as you can to touching it, the aspect of you that's outside of it, of outside of the human earthly place, looking down on the experience. Now, I agree that you can't just walk into that perspective, but you can work on it. We all can work on it. And I believe those that truly believe perspective number two will radiate that out, almost like an aura. The first, of course, is just a normal human experience that 99.99999% of anybody that's ever walked the earth has or has had. Most people have never broken out of that perspective. And on the chart, it's low. That's low on the spiritual chart here, this huge spiritual chart taped to my wall. That's low, it says. The second is a totally different spiritual perspective that most people that have walked the earth never uh, truly achieve or even touch. And that's very high on this taped up chart. Now, the reality itself, what's it set up to do? It's set up to only, at least as the culture and society has been hijacked, you know, somebody got on me, Matt, stop assigning it to the entire reality. It's the, you keep talking about the dark portions or the hijacked portions. Maybe that doesn't really, it's not suited to say the entire reality. I need to work on my semantics there, but, but I hear you. But the reality or the hijack part, what's it set up? Only to present number one. Only to get you to believe that the only thing that exists is number one. And it works tireless, tirelessly to hide perspective two. It doesn't any, want anybody dabbling in perspective number two. So much so it pretends that perspective doesn't even exist. One can go kindergarten through 12th grade, all through school, all through college, and not hear a word in their entire quote, end quote, education. They have not heard the word soul or spirit uttered even one damn time in 12 years. The notion of existence beyond this life and this earth is not even mentioned in school. You can't talk about religion. Well, what does that have to do with religion? It doesn't mean you're going to start preaching Catholicism and what is the body and the, and the blood. It, it has nothing to do with religion, just in general talking about that one may exist outside this earthly experience, not mentioned in school under the guise, the false guise of we can't talk about religion. No, that's just their excuse because they'll never mention it. The, the whole not nilk, not nilk reality doesn't, doesn't go there. You know, but millions of fifth graders at the same time have been lectured to very extensively about masturbation. Yeah, that makes sense. In my school, many of us had to carry an egg around all day long without breaking it. The egg was supposed to represent a child, and you would learn everything you needed to know about parenting by carrying an egg around school all day long without breaking it. Yeah, that's a heck of a parenting lesson. We've all heard this slogan before. If you break it, you bought it. Like if you're in an expensive store and you knock over a vase, if you break it, you bought it. In my high school, it was if you break it, you eat it. One kid broke his son, his egg. He broke his son. He called it his son. And he had a lunch lady put it on an English muffin and he ate it. Now, this ridiculous folly inside a very serious, important presentation has a purpose to remind you this is what school is. <laughs> and then it's ridiculous maths and math. Then in Europe, they say maths. 
we say math, that you can't ever apply to anything unless you're some sort of phys- physicist applying it to sending a hot water heater up into the ionosphere. bunch of math that you can't understand. They don't ever mention, here's what you could be, here's what you are, here are the different theories or philosophies on life after death. No mention whatsoever of soul or spirit. Okay, you get it, but that's basically all you need to know about the reality itself and the tricks that it's up to when its own brainwashing system of schools doesn't even mention these things. With the main trick, of course, being to hide you from understanding yourself. It all comes back to that. In fact, the half page could be one sentence. It's an entire reality system that's trying to hide you from yourself. End of story. Goodbye. This might not be the best example, but you know, I love the analogy of the Sims video game related to kind of our situation or predicament, you know, the Sims video game. So just go with it. If a Sims character in the video game could transcend his video game, could overcome it, you know, what would be, just go with it. You, how do you know he can't? You don't know for sure that he can't. These, these, each Sim character has probably developed sentience. You don't know. Well, if any, either way, what would be the only way for that poor devil stuck in that damn video game to rise above and get out? The only way, if he had any chance at all, would he spiritually actualize inside the video game by limiting his perspective and his perception to just seeing through his digital eyes of his poorly dressed Sim? Would that Sim... Uh, rise above by worrying about what's right in front of him in the little game like burning meat on the grill and not getting tickets to Kajagugu because they were in town? No. The only chance he would have is to pause and to change his perception and look down on himself from, quote, a perception that comes from somewhere else or perception that comes from above. And then in terms of the Sims game that's happening right in front of him, put every bit of nonsense that's happening in the proper context. You know, meat burning on the grill, no Kajigugu tickets, a bunch of Zynga cows ride by. Wait a second. You know, I'm designed in this video game to take all this seriously, but I think there's some bigger things going on. This is all some sort of illusory bullshit. I mean, maybe there's a chord somewhere, a, a, a chord to my higher self, or there's somebody playing me like the really sick and weird movie Gamer, he, at least if he starts m- moving down this yellow brick road, he has a chance. Now, I like the analogy. I'm not saying you're in a Sims game being played, completely being played by your higher self with controllers and you have no free will and all that. I'm not, I'm not going that far, but I just – I like the analogy. I'd love to be playing the Sims game and I try to get him to move a little closer to the grill and the meats and I'm pushing the button and he just stops and he's not even following the commands anymore. And he turns around in the game and he looks he, – like he's looking right at me and he says, get me the fuck out of here. He's, he became sentient. I mean, I, I would love for that to happen. We need to do the same thing to the aspect of us that's not here in this earthly Sims game paradise. I'm not saying this is the Sims game, but this reality is some sort of fake construct that is 99% less real than what it's presented to be from these idiots that present themselves as authority. 99% less real than these idiots that take a podium that'll say this and that, and this is troublesome, and that is troublesome. You know, screw you, everybody that takes a podium. You don't know, and they believe it. They're not, these people that take a podium, they're not, they're not in the know trying to deceive you. They're completely deceived themselves more than anybody else. We know now how ridiculously fake the world is, even though we'll have um, minor disagreements on specifics. We've seen enough. I mean, most of us are convinced at this point. We don't need to see any more reality breakdowns, reality glitches, impossible coincidences, synchronicities, mind-blowing dramatria, Mandela effects, the masses all running around us doing the same exact thing, acting the same way, like they're on some sort of download and tuned to some sort of frequency, the Ukrainian president running around on Dancing with the Stars for crying out loud, we've seen enough. So let's relate all this to the purpose of this presentation. Remember the opening sentences about perception. Number one, just living life, looking out through the eyes of the Sim character. Everything that comes up in front of you is important. You're spiritually aware in number one, but always trying to find it. You're not there. You don't believe it or you, you want to believe it. But, you know, number just walk into number two. Number two is you're the controller of the Sims game. It's more of a perspective looking down. 
your the the timeless aspect with the earthly experience. Again, we've all heard that. It's almost trite or whatever, a, a cliche at this point, but but we need to actually every day work on the, the perception. The perception, remember what's his name? Jake Sully in Avatar. Well, he it was easy for him to have the perception of the big blue creature because his whole consciousness was put in to the big, big blue creature. But it's like that. We have maybe it can't be that simple for us, but we have to have the perception of climbing around the trees in the blue creature, the higher creature, and forego the perception of Jake Sully, who, you know, in the movie, he is he he is handicapped, he cannot walk, but that is a metaphor for the other limitations probably of the human being. You know what I'm saying? So the main theme here, remember, is whatever spiritual progress you're making. I think is directly related linearly to your perception or the number one or number two perspective and perception. You can rate yourself because you know you can't hide from yourself in terms of what your perception really is. Matt, you have that? No, I don't have it, but I'm working on it. We have to work on it. Oh, push the doors open to the beautiful Walmart and work on it. It's like, okay, oh, they're stocked out of eggs or Okay, like play your video game from a different perception. I mean, Neo in Matrix is a good example. What was his perspective on the world in the first scene? He believed the Matrix was the real world, people knocking at his door, come out to the club, follow the white rabbit. He didn't know shit about shit. Now, think of Neo in the last scene, right before they played the Rage Against the Machine. He's on the phone. He's seen everything. He's seen the Matrix from two different perspectives. He's, he's developed his own uh, powers. He's threatening the, I think, I don't know who he's talking to on the phone, but he, maybe it's the architect. He's threatening the architect on the phone. I mean, completely different perception of what is going on Neo by the end of the movie. That's what we need to do that. Not just ch check little boxes off that we're learning this and learning that just like literally walk into a new perception. And we haven't talked about that much. So you have to decide what you are. Are you just another one of these lost humans looking out for an answer? Says begging somebody give me an answer, please somebody. I mean, I don't mean to. Um, I just my grandfather just popped into my mind, and I don't want to make fun of anything there. But remember what I said in the last video. He was so desperate for something to fill his spiritual void because it was inside him. He was absolutely real person, no doubt about that. We're outside of Philadelphia, so this area outside of Boston and different areas in the Northeast can be dominated by the Catholic Church. It's like two to one. He found the Catholic Church. I mean, he didn't know what he was getting into. He just needed something. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't, not going to get too much detail. I don't, I don't think he found the right thing. I mean, finding Voldemort, uh, you know, doing tarot cards could have been better for him. But uh, well, hey, at least it proved he was real. He was searching for something. And see, that's what the reality does. When you're hungry for the breadcrumbs, oh, it presents a nice shiny yellow one, and that's what it did to my grandfather. So, in terms of walking into this new perception. What's great about it is you can't fool yourself. You know exactly where you stand day to day. And the reality, you, you can see how desperate it wants you locked into perception number one because of you, all the tricks that it plays and all its manipulations and deceptions as you step into the different perception or do the research that we've done over the last 10 years, its ruse becomes more and more pathetic more and more desperate. It, it's, it's what? It's ru your ruse. I don't appreciate your ruse, ma'am. My what? Your cunning attempt to trick me. I don't, reality, I don't participate. I don't really appreciate your ruse anymore. And I see through it. But for the reality itself, in some way to survive or harness the energy, whatever it does in its sick little places, it needs people generally only operating through perception number one and running around like scared assholes. That It needs people doing a certain thing to create a certain type of energy it feeds on or something like louche. This is a little strange. We'll go a little bit off to the side for a second, but it just seems relevant. It popped into my head. Remember in The Matrix, whatever it was, two or three, when Smith 
the agent in the matrix, he puts his consciousness somehow into a real body. And the person on the ship he put his consciousness into, which looked and acted like the actor Smith, his name was Bane, I believe. His name was Bane. And he said, do you, do you, I don't know what it's, he said exactly, but do you recognize me, Mr. Anderson? Like, no, it can't be. Look closely, Mr. Anderson. Look closely through these dull cow eyes. Now, very, very interesting. His perspective, perception, it was much greater. He was in the body of this Bane. His name was Bane, I believe. And he's like, I can't – He, I think he said to, to Mr. Anderson or Neo at one point, he said, how do you like stand it in this? This like, It stinks. How do you stand living in these bodies? He had a greater perception, uh, perspective. Are you – Matt, you're not saying – that we should work on basically trying to emulate Agent Smith. No, but you see what I'm saying. He was like, oh, my – it was a whole new perspective being in the body, looking out through those dull cow eyes. And where to us, that's not only all we know, the reality hides any other possibility. That's all I'm saying. So another strange example, the average person dies – and um, I know the no. If I say the word judgment or anything like that, the no consequences people will be emailing me once a like the way Andy Dufresne wrote the letter once a week for fifty years. I, I got, but it could be an element of an aspect of you talking to you upon death, or to make it palatable for the no consequences people, and some a element of your higher self, not some arconic being coming trying to put you back into a body, but an element of your own self comes to you, an aspect of it, and says you. You failed. You you failed. I failed? How do you know? Because you never broke the perspective and the perception of looking out in just in the, through those dull cow eyes, the perception and perspective of the of the Sims character with the Zynga cows running by. I could see you never broke it. You never rose above it. You never look down upon yourself. You can't hide from yourself. You know I'm I'm right. You can't hide from me an aspect of yourself. So you got to go do it again. Again? With us down there? Uh, do I have to work, wash dishes in the same Chinese restaurant? Yes, you have to wash dishes in that same Chinese restaurant. Now get back there and do it right this time. Now, as we've talked about, one of reality's main tricks is to keep you in this wrong perspective. And one of the ways it does that, the same run up the middle, blocking and tackling drills, it does the same way every single time. It desperately needs you or the real people here to take this reality seriously, to always see it through the dull cow eyes. And again, this is an area where at least our little group has done a pretty good job. Just like that list I mentioned a few minutes back, we've seen this, we've seen that. We don't, we don't going to fall for these same tricks anymore and our perception is starting to change. But at least for most real people, not, there's not all real people are in our group. Now, whoever's real out there, we're still only a tiny percentage of a percentage. Unfortunately, right now, it still seems to have most real people fooled with its main goal to hide a real person from its true nature. It all comes back to that, as I said earlier, to hide a real person from understanding what it really is. And its main tactic is keeping people in perspective number one, looking out one way through their dull cow eyes, taking having these people looking out with one perspective or one perception, taking everything seriously. So it's like if we could, it's like this leads to this leads to that. If you can just take one domino out, the whole reality domino line falls apart, but I don't get it. I don't know how it pulls this shit off because it's ruse is so pathetic at this point, but still there's not a whole lot of us that see these things. I guess a bit of good news of course is it, we know it desperately needs to be believed in. And in the past, I've said this many times, it's presentation was more professional. You've heard me say that. I'm not going to get into that, but it is good news that it's presentation now at least to us, is really pathetic. I mean, it's really lame. And, you know, you, you hope that the lameness of what it presents through the news or whatever authority is saying Elon Musk is up to, you know, you'd hope that at some point it just becomes such a clown show that the more and more regular people just start to see through it and stop taking it serious. But the other side of that 
gets back to, I mean, I guess the bad news, the ship of fools on the river of insanity. The theory there was even though we're standing on the bank, so to, you know, the ship is sailing, we're, we're standing on the bank, it's getting farther and farther away. It's becoming more ridiculous to us, but only to us, potentially, because it's like the people on the ship or your cousin or your brother or your brother from another mother, they're being reset almost like as the reality changes and becomes more pathetic. They're on some sort of download. They change their frequency and they set or reset themselves to it so they don't think there's anything wrong. One of the key elements to the old um, Ship of Fools and the River of Insanity presentation was the ship sailing is like a fluid reality changing. We're rooted to something at least that's not moving. That's why it becomes more and more bizarre to us, its presentation. It's similar to – I was going to say that the ship changes. Everybody on board changes with it or resets their frequency or morphs with it. Think of another thing just popped into my head. I don't know if this analogy is any good or not, but remember the horse of a different color? Um, hopefully all the damn dye that they put on that damn horse didn't kill it back in 1939. Every time they'd shoot away and the horse would be bright orange and then it would be bright green and then it would be bright bright blue, you know, right when, after that little bastard finally let them in to, to the land of, of the, the castle of Oz or whatever. And the horse, would every time they, they shot the horse... And hopefully they use different horses or the amount of dye they would have put on that damn thing would have killed it. But the horse of a different color and the horse changes. We saw it change in the Wizard of Oz. And they're like, wow, that horse just changed to bright blue. And everybody in the room's like, it's always been blue. See, that it's kind of like, like that. So even though we hope the presentations or whatever's coming on the news, it's just getting so ridiculous. We might be the only ones that act, can actually see it as ridiculous. Because we're standing on the bank of the river, you know, waving goodbye to the love boat in the Pacific, Princess and Isaac, already trying to eye what Isaac and Gopher trying to already eye up what passenger they're going to try to get on those little horny bastards. I probably watched over fifty episodes of the Love Boat. I spent every weekend for about eight years at my grandmother's house and my grandfather's house. It must have been on on a Friday night or Saturday. It was Love Boat followed by Fantasy Island. She would take over the TV, Love Boat. There was one TV. What am I going to do? Love Boat, Fantasy Island. And the, I tell you, I don't want to stray too much. This isn't that important. But when the, when the doctor on board that damn ship had a love interest, it bothered me. So I mean, even when Gopher had a love interest, it, it was okay. But that doctor was so slimy to me. And he looked – I mean I'm like – what? I'm in seventh grade watching this. He looked like he was 120 years old. Well, the girls he was getting with looked pretty, in their 20s. I said, like, who would date this slime? I, it bothered the hell. Even when Captain Steubing had a damn relationship, that was okay with me. The doctor, boy, he bugged me. Sorry, back to the main point, slightly more important. If you can – if people can finally stop taking its presentation seriously – just say that I'm, this is ridiculous. It's everything then starts to break down if people, real people, start doing this. It becomes a castrated King Kong. You know, it's like the bumble from the after its teeth got ripped out in Rudolph. It just becomes completely impotent. But it is taken seriously by most real people. And then emotions like fear, stress, worry, anxiety, all of these things then cement in their perspective number one. The fear, worry, anxiety, all these emotions that come out, even the seven deadly sins to a degree, it all of that works to cement in perspective number one and to hide perspective number two from real people. And more than anything else in the world, it needs real people to believe in it for these reasons. Okay? It does this one more time by fostering the lower emotions in generator beings. To me and many smart people, the whole reality wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for at least the collective conscious of some. We'll put it that way. Um, mind before everything. Mind before the Big Bang. <laughs> the, the Big Bang. Are you kidding? The Big Bang Theory. And they just put it right in your face on a damn TV show. It's a, they, the truth's in everything. They have to give it away. I don't want to insult anyone, but only a Sim character looking out from this perspective, number one, can get stressed out over all this bullshit. Matt, you're completely stress-free? No. 
but I catch myself and I work on it daily. We're not going to be perfect. It take, it'll take decades. We still might not be perfect on the day of our death, but we're working on it. Let's look at this dumb example. Somebody's in a burger place waiting for their burger. How do you want it, Jeff? Medium well. I told you twice already, Fred. Medium well. Last time it was bloody. So he said, I'm going to make my burger. I'm going to play my Pac-Man game. So he goes over. He goes, remember the Pac-Man games? Not the ones that they were flat. You act, you could sit down at a little table. Remember that? It only That's from like the 70s or something. You'd actually eat on it and you could sit down and play Space Invaders on like a – it was flat. Well, the guy playing – or the girl playing that game – he doesn't assign any emotion to what's going on into that into that game. It's just so lame. It might be fun why the guy's burning his burger, but there's no emotion given to it. Okay, you're not equating this life to Pac-Man. Well, I'm trying to. I know it's a stretch. Now, this game is designed a lot better than that Pac-Man, but in some ways, it's more pathetic. This game of life here, hijacked or not was first and foremost designed to be believed in and taken seriously. Once you realize that the witch has what did they what did Glenda say? You go away. You have no power here to the to the green witch. You have the witch has no power here if it's not believed in and that starts by not taking it seriously. How many times in this presentation have I said not take it seriously, the word serious? You know what comes to mind? They seem to revolve everything around the dog star and shit that I don't understand, I don't want to understand. But phonetically, it's the same word, serious, serious, spelled different. But you know they work that way with phonetically the same. And Is there a reason that the one word assigned to the star, the dog star, has the meaning over... I, yes, there probably is. It's just the way this we, weird reality works. It's more... If anything, it adds more credibility to what I'm saying because even in the name of that star, it needs to be taken seriously or assigned importance, if you see what I'm saying. But I don't want to stray into, into these strange weeds. And, and these are areas, I, uh, in terms of how they really do business, I don't truly understand. And I don't want to understand it. I'm here to understand myself. Okay, at this point, if there was a major final exam and a test, I said, write out what is perspective number one versus perspective number two. And where you operate daily and where you eventually want to operate, you'd be able to write that out and probably pass the test. We don't have to keep reiterating that. Okay. Now, we know that if reality was an all-you-can-eat Warren Buffett buffet, and all-you-can-eat Warren Buffett buffet, it slops perception number one on your plate all day long. You can have as many helpings and heaps of that greasy shit as you want. As long as, as, long as you don't dabble into perception number two, it hides that under the counter next to its shotgun. It doesn't even tell you about that. Now, but your receptor for perception number one is how it wants most people operating. It's simply the thinking brain, the frontal lobes, the ego mind. The receptor in you for number two, to me, is more the heart and, or parts of the mind or parts of the subconscious that I always say has some sort of spiritual link out of here that is not stuck in the Sims game. Again, where are the places that this reality assigns merit and importance and stock, you know, somebody will, oh, we just got, oh, Freddie just got his PhD and he puts a big PhD and a big plastic gold frame on the wall and he, the, all the metrics and awards that society reaps on people to keep them in perception <laughs> number one and people, oh, we're going to have a party. We just had a closing on the beach home. Oh, great. Yeah. You know. Because it can't be entirely hidden, the reality or the hijacked reality does acknowledge heart, but again, it'll try to warp their perception or try to hijack it or try to hide the, the real meaning or take that away from people. Because heart in this reality, it's presented exclusively as – or the, the truth you can find through heart. No, that's just for romantic love and even that's hijacked because it usually perverts that into, into what we call lust. For crying out loud, this reality is now representing the Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee thing to a whole new generation. Does the uh, Illuminati Control Center, Chernobyl, does the current generation know what happened between Pam Anderson and Tommy Lee and the sex tapes? No, they don't. We need to reintroduce that beautiful story via a whole new documentary. You believe they're recycling that horseshit back? Are you kidding me? 
I mean, is there any greater example of stalled century than recycling in a documentary the Pamela Anderson, Tommy Lee? This local the, – the, okay, it's not for the younger generation, but the younger generation, not only they don't give a shit, they don't even know who these two people are about a sex – and it wasn't, of course, guys, 100 percent contrived, scripted reality. These sex tapes that Paris Hilton uh, – come on. Come on. Kardashian, all part of a really pathetic script. I don't believe this is a prison planet, as the truth community loves to talk about. I don't believe anybody's truly trapped here. At the mercy, you know, means they you don't have control. That's what a lot of the truth community seems to present. I think this is completely wrong. I don't think anybody's trapped here at the mercy of God's demons or archonic beings that need to be groveled for or you need to get permission or it's up to us if we are trapped here it's still it's up to us and it is possible i guess the creeps have tricks that if the tricks are successful can potentially keep you here playing the game or bring you back or recycle but the most important thing and i'm not just saying this to make myself feel good is it's up to us now how do we know this uh, Matt, you're just saying that to make yourself feel better. You, you screwed. You, you, know, you know you screwed just like the rest of us. You're just trying to make yourself feel good. No, I'm not. Look, look around. Spin around and observe the entire reality. One only plays a trick be, to get somebody to do something that it can't do itself. It wouldn't, if it was in such control, it wouldn't play endless tricks. It's just the nature of a trick. Why does anybody play a trick? to elicit something in that person that it can't just directly force them to do. It needs They need to be tricked into doing it. whole reality is a trick. If they're in control, there wouldn't be a trick. It's so obvious. And the general theme in, I don't know, media or movies or literature of having to do it to yourself, the way reality presents it, this theme of having to do it or doom yourself is never ending. Uh, three... Four years ago, whenever I talked about it, maybe it wasn't that long ago, it was – um, what is it? Um, the Devil Went Down to, to Georgia, which is the – who sings that song? Um, Charlie Daniels Band. The Devil Went Down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. Um, Johnny stepped up in the fiddle competition and played fiddle against the devil in some sort of competition. Did the devil grab Johnny, rip his arm up behind his back and force him to compete? No, John – Johnny chose to compete, and he was lured into it by you get a golden fiddle or something. If you win, he chose it. And also, we won't get into a whole new video, but the devil lost on purpose, of course, because what would what do you think Johnny did with his golden fiddle? You think he, he used it to start an orphanage? No, he, the devil lost on purpose. But the point is Johnny got himself into that. This, is it. this theme repeats over and over and over again. For crying out loud, what was that movie um, – Winston sent me a cheesy old movie with Robert Ulrich, Ulrich, whatever it's called. Invent it was from like the late seventies or something. Invitation to Hell. Susan Lucci, Lucci, Susan Lucci of she was a famous actress in soap operas. She plays like the devil, and it's this club. And if you're initiated into this club, it actually the the doors, the back doors to the club lead to hell itself. And she's got the whole family in there, and Robert Ulrich's trying to – I'm sorry, the spoilers. I mean, who who really wants to see to this movie, although I'm glad um, Winston recommended it. And she's like threatening him at the end, like, I'm going to damn you. And he's like, no, you're not. If you could, you would have already done it. Exactly. That's, that's a whole truth drop. You know, he has to do it. Um, the Faustian bargain, it's the same themes over and over and over again. It's even re related to Jesus on the mountain with Satan. Satan offers the kingdoms. He, it's, Jesus had to take the bait. He, didn't, he couldn't force Jesus into it. It's the same dumb theme over and over again. So why would anybody think that we are truly on a prison planet with no – they would relax if they had it all worked out. Why are they working so hard? I, I, this stuff is so obvious, but I have to keep saying it over and over again because the truth community keeps saying their dumb crap over and over again. There is one small proviso here in some fine print that's worth talking about. It applies, in my opinion, to those who truly had a choice. My bet favorite example, I bring this up every time, is the 18-year-old who was dropped off um, on D-Day at Utah and Omaha Beach and ran into 
uh, the nest of machine guns on the beach. The 18-year-old – I don't think – he didn't have a choice, okay? 18-year-old threatened with jail if he didn't enlist or even if there – I don't know what, what parts of the draft uh, were in place at that time during World War II. But did that 18-year-old really have a chance – he had he just that young person could see through all the propaganda and, and predict even you know we have so much so many tools to our advantage now in in understanding how reality works you would have believed every bit of it back in the day the presentation of pearl harbor we all would have believed every bit of it bit of it that 18 year old didn't have a choice as to being plopped out on Utah and Omaha Beach, running in front of mach- machine gun nest, is, is I mean, there's actually I don't I don't know how anybody would present the other side, but there's a certain segment of the truth community that would still hold on to well, everybody has a choice, Matt. Oh, sure, yeah, c- no, okay. If it's deemed that people were the trick, um, especially for a younger individual, at some point somebody's a child. They can't see through the trick, and they weren't given a choice. So that, in terms of damning or dooming it to yourself, there is a lot of fine print that where these these creeps have broken the rules, essentially, and, and that doesn't apply. And guys, I know we could get into things like um, the creep level, the minions, the dark ones are, are literally just um, a reflection of ourselves – uh, a reflection of collective consciousness of real people as it is moved lower or is more uh, taken away from truly what it, it, it can be, the creeps and what they're able to do, gain more power. And if it wasn't for us generating it, they wouldn't exist. And all of these things are, are on the table. But again, the main presentation here or the part of the half page I'm focusing on is that, remember, the perception. Are you in perception number one? Or are you rising above and taking on perception and perspective number two? That, you know, that, that's, that's the focus here, and I don't want to stray too far from that. And to the no consequences people, I would ask them, why is there in this reality then an endless presentation or archetype of one dooming themselves? Right from Johnny and the fiddle competition with the devil, the Charlie Daniels band, to thousands upon thousands of other examples of somebody having to do themselves. What is what is all that for if there's no consequences whatsoever? At the end of the day, um, I don't care if there are consequences or not because I'm going to make the correct and moral choice either way. If somebody tells me or convinces me there are no consequences because your higher self would never let your uh, self here flush away all its soul tokens, you can't truly be harmed, and the other things that the no consequences people talk about, and they make very good points, it doesn't matter to me either way because I'm going to do the same thing. So that's the the beauty of it. It doesn't matter because I'm going to do the – it's not like if somebody could convince me there's no consequences, I'm going to run out and start pushing little old ladies into traffic. I'm not going to do that either way. So I'm just – for the purpose of this presentation, it's in this place, all the evidence of which – hundreds of thousands of pieces of evidence across literature, movies, the presentation of this, the presentation of that, one has to doom themselves. Okay, we're going to stick with that for now. So let's – on the other side though, this minion level of Gates, Gaga, and Galifianakos, (laughs) the three Gs in in this example of the minion level, Gates, Gaga, and Galifianakos from The Hangover – they in some way, in some way, may be trapped here. Now, I'm changing my perspective a little bit on this, but I don't want to stray, and we can go in a million different places. Every sentence, you could go off in all these different places. In some way, they're, they're not as spiritually progressed as we are. They're more trapped here, okay? The highest level truth that I'm coming around to is, is if you back up far enough, the ultimate truth, and we're going to come out on the other side one day, is we're kind of all really connected, potentially all one, but I'm not, I haven't even gotten into that yet. But in terms of these creeps, you know, they're in some way um, definitely more shackled to this reality. And misery loves company. Of course, they want you to stay here with them. You know, they, they in some way, you'd have to be a little trapped here to keep trying to send a hot water heater up into the stratosphere. Why are you doing stupid shit like that to enter entertain yourself like buying 666 Fifth Avenue or whatever Jared and his father did before he went to jail or whatever. It's like they just they're, they're, they 
kind of give themselves away. They're kind of doomed here, at least going to be a lot longer than we are, um, because they, you know, they're like jaded. Like, why else would David Bowie go off with Mick Jagger? Don't they have supermodel girlfriends and wives? So they give themselves away because they're always trying to do stupid shit. Speaking of uh, Galifianakis, remember that dumb between tooth ferns? I mean, come, you know what? We're so tired of the stupid symbolism all the time. Just give it a break. Put it away for a few years. I mean, aren't you tired of it? Between two ferns, of course, relates to the same old stuff, the towers, the pillars. I mean, we're t- aren't you sick of it? We're sick of it. Same presentations over and over again. Find some creativity. Bono probably going for another <laughs> photo shoot in New York is 666 photo shoot. And the photographer was like, cover your right eye now, Bono. He's like, again? I did this 7,000 times. You're asking me to cover the right. Even I'm getting tired of the same dumbass symbolism. Bono, don't make me place the, the phone call to your superiors. You'll be put into the break room, which is from Severance on Apple TV. Cover the right eye now, Bono. The ending of this segment's pretty simple. If this was a prison planet and they had complete control over you and you have to grovel before somebody to get out or whatever, it's very simple. They wouldn't work so – you've heard me say this a few thousand times, but nothing is more important. They wouldn't work so hard to manipulate and deceive real people 24-7, 365. As I've said, I'd be worried if they stopped working hard. And a day came, we woke up, and it was like – Something's not right about the world today. Like, what? I can't put my finger on it. There, this not milk reality is like not getting up in my business. It's not. It's leaving me alone. It's leaving you alone. Isn't that a good thing? Well, yeah, it is a good thing. But I don't know because it works so hard all the time. It gives itself away that it's in no real position of power. If it starts leaving me alone, I mean, has it won? And it doesn't have to work hard, guys. It's not leaving us alone. As it, right now, it's tremendous good news how pathetically hard it works. As long as it's working so hard, 24-7, 365, and look at the presentations on the news in the last couple of weeks or in the last couple of years. You know, as long as it's doing that, real people, real people that are set, that have set themselves on the right path, in my opinion, have nothing to worry about. Or they wouldn't be working so hard. If it was as simple as some archonic being meets you at the moment of your death and is going to recycle you right back and you have no chance to go into the right light or the wrong light, well, then what's it doing all this stuff in your life for? It's just going to bring you – what's it doing all this stuff now for? I know about the loosh and the energy, but no, it, it, it's, it's working too hard. It is not in, in a firm position of control. It's not a prison planet. I'm going to use Star Wars again. Somebody made a comment that something like, Matt went three days in a row (laughs) without mentioning Star Wars. Well, I like Star Wars as incredible metaphysical truths that flow through that movie. It can be used in presentations like this in a hundred different ways. And I don't have any original ideas. Everything I get, I I take from movies and I amalgamate it together into something that makes a little bit of sense. So here we go. This is very apt. I'm going to continue to use Star Wars. I take you back now to a very disturbing scene in The Empire Strikes Back, which we thought was number two, was actually number four. Darth Vader has taken the entire fleet into the asteroid belt, and he's looking not for Luke. He's looking for Han and Leia. He's looking for Luke's friends. He's so desperate. You can, There's a huge truth drop. He's so desperate to find Luke. He can't find Luke. He needs to get Chewie and Han and Leia and then torture them to lure Luke in. Even 50 years later, we didn't really realize that. Many of you didn't realize that about – he's looking to lure Luke. And he's like, we can't take much more – assuming the punishment we've taken, he, they're surely dead. No, I don't care about asteroids, General. <laughs> Get – find – take the entire freaking fleet into an asteroid belt with half of them being killed. Now, the point is when Luke sees that, let's say he didn't know how powerful he was or he's just a little Jedi, could move a little bottle tops around on the table. He doesn't know his true potential. And Luke says – Vader just moved the entire fleet into an asteroid belt just to get Han to torture him so that will bring me to him? Holy heck, I must be way more powerful than I thought I was. I got to – immediately he has the confidence then to stop moving little bottle tops around with his finger on tabletops and start moving buildings up into the air. He just – the way they operate just gave Luke the consequence. 
or why would they he be the whole damn fleet's being destroyed by the asteroid belt telling Luke exactly who he is? Now this is all very good news for Luke. What if it was the opposite? What if General uh, Tarkin? What was that his name? Tarkin. What if he calls Vader up and he says, "Should we pursue Luke, uh, my lord? <laughs> what, what do they call him, Lord Vader? Should not my lord? Should we pursue Luke, Lord Vader?" And he's like, "Who, Luke? You know the potential, the potential Jedi, your son, Luke, the white boy. Oh, 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 yes." That dumbass <laughs> – I can't, I can't do Vader. I'm not going to – that little dumbass son of a beach. Oh, yeah. I had nearly forgot about his dumbass. Nah. Don't even waste an R2 droid searching for that little fucker. So what would Luke do when he found out about that? He said, well, I thought I had the potential to be this tremendous Jedi and my father, Lord Vader, he wouldn't even – what? He wouldn't even waste an R2 droid on my dumbass? That would that that's the best weapon against Luke there is. It just destroys his confidence. So what is the reality doing to you and me? It's moving its it's moving its entire fleet into it into an asteroid belt. That's damn good news. Let's pause. Let me remind you of the opening sentences of this presentation. The whole point here is about perception, your own perspective. Are you operating perspective number one? Or more of perspective number two, where you're looking down as the observer, as the overall consciousness, you know, all of that. Don't forget all of that. Now, in terms of practicing that or stepping into that as you walk through the Walmart threshold, the, your attitude toward it matters. We might not get it overnight, but overall, your attitude towards it and your reminder of the right attitude before the perception or perspective becomes ingrained. So the right perspective stops feeding this sick, not nil system. And then the energy, then you start feeding yourself. Energy, say here, is fixed. Some would say infinite. Some would say fixed inside the reality. So no, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, you can take that energy and you can use it to feed the not milk bumble, or you can use it to feed yourself. Attitude is everything. Shawshank, one of my favorite examples of all time. I got to do a whole. People have shared a lot of things with me, things I missed about more truths in Shawshank. They're just incredible. Got to do a whole presentation. The truth drops on Shawshank are endless, and that's why it's on TV more than anything else. It's one of those things like where they have to show you, but that's for another time. It was my favorite scene is the parole, Red's parole hearings, rejection. There were three in the movie, I believe. First one, Red just grovels before them, a begging attitude, bowing down. What do they want to hear? Rejected, stamp rejected right across his forehead. I think they did on the first one. Big, big, put it in the ink and right on his forehead, rejected. Get out of here. Second one, same thing. Oh, I'm re oh, rehabilitated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just what, what is, can you tell me what you want to hear so I could parrot that back? The third one, he didn't give a shit. The, his whole aura changed. His perspective changed. And it's not just about not giving a shit, but that was a big part of it. The attitude of, screw you, sons of bitches. I don't need – it was more about like, I don't need you. I don't care about saying what you want to hear or predicting what you want. I don't – you know, maybe I am somewhat screwed here, but I don't need you anymore. And they, they sensed it and the results immediately changed for him. He totally stopped playing their game. The results changed, and why did they change? To me, they changed because he had – he basically become a problem for them. They sensed that this, this guy is like a computer virus in our system. We don't want to keep a computer virus in our system, so let's, let's give him parole. Get him out of here. Let him be somebody else's problem. Spiritually, we existed before birth, so it's logical to assume in some way you agreed to come here – or if you're an aspect of your higher self, you so somebody at some point agreed to be put in here. You know what? We're oh, we were tricked in here, and this is a prison planet. Give me a, if you maybe you can 
you know, again, the no consequences people don't love this, but if you give yourself away, you make all the bad decisions, you decide to do the fiddle competition against the devil, and you get played and just give – okay, maybe you can be doomed or tricked or whatever, screwed, but, you know, there might be a consequence. There might not be, but you're not – no, they, there's a part of the truth community that believes, as a spiritual being, we were tricked into this prison. Come on, give me a break. Come on, no. I, and, well, how do you know, Matt? I don't know, but every single bit of inner knowing just says that is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. In order for the Earth experience to benefit our spiritual whole, whether you believe it's a school or whatever, whatever, whatever you believe, there's no doubt that there's. With, with the, the creeps are playing a role here, and we can benefit. We, would I, we disagree on the specifics, but there's no – we all agree we can find tremendous benefit from this experience. In order to find that benefit, we needed to come in here Tommy, the deaf, dumb, and blind kid. We needed the memory wipe. The Grand Theft Auto game of life must be 100 percent believable to get anything out of it. If you had recollection – of any part of yourself, even spiritually that you existed before birth, all of the – you wouldn't take any of this seriously. You'd get nothing out of it. And Matt, didn't you just say not to take it seriously? Yes, but that this is the growth process. When I, when I was in college and I went to work for the big insurance company in my 20s and just a child of the matrix, of course I believed in everything, everything that Peter Jennings said I believed. It's the growth process of being able to see through it. It's, it's that whole – that's what one of the huge benefits that this life affords. But initially, at least, it must be 100 percent believable to get anything out of it. And one of the main reasons you likely came here, in addition to everything we've, we've talked about – we talked about this one a few months back too – is to actually – or to have the spiritual part of you experience the notion of non-existence or death. I'm not saying – it doesn't feel that this is the main reason for being here, but when I presented that Damien Rice song Cannonball a month or two back, I'm like, yeah, one of the main purposes here is to actually understand what it feels like not to exist. If you have recollection of your, – you're part of something that always was, always will be, part of, an, of God or initial source – collectively, if you back up far enough, we're all one, then it's like, okay, then that takes, for lack of better words, the fun out of it. Damien Rice Cannonball song. It's an incredible song too, by the way. Damien Rice Cannonball. Life taught me to die. And life taught me to die. It's like, how do I, the notion of death to a spiritual being is like, a, there's no, they might be able to like, you know, pass a test and parrot back the definition, but they're not going to truly understand it unless you're put into this reality system with a with a mind wipe. And then you get out of it. It's like, oh, yeah. I For half of my life, I, you know, somebody might say, I carried the fear of atheism and complete non-existence. I experienced that. That's one of the main reasons. But then, of course, we're, we're overcoming it. The notion of being wiped, existence, all of existence being wiped out upon death, um, to us at this point is absurd. It really – every bit of evidence, if you, ob- if you ignore uh, the evening news and Nova, progr- Nova programming on PBS tells you that, that the core's existence just continues. That's where we disagree on what it might be, but it doesn't get snuffed out like the atheists say. That's ridiculous. And you know my perspective is in no way religious at all. So a- anyway, life taught me to die. That absolutely one of the the main the, the actual I remember absolutely remember the moment I've said this before when I realized for, for real I was going to die. If you would have asked me in a tenth grade, Matt, are you going to die? I would have known what answer to give. Well, of course I'm going to die, but I truly wouldn't have believed it. The moment it actually I, I understood it, and it shook me. I was in my early twenties. I remember exactly where I was in Long Beach Island when it happened. Um, and you know that that feeling only this life can give, as well as this life can only deliver a host of other things that, like a spiritual being, uh, can't experience outside of this weird place. 
that Star Trek episode, The Next Generation, I've talked about a few times, where Q, the all-powerful Q, omnipotent being, loses all of his godlike abilities. For those that don't know the show, he can snap his fingers and move Mars or you know move planets around. And obviously the presentation of space is traditional in Star Trek. He can just do anything at the snap of a finger. He loses his godlike immortality and abilities, appears on the Enterprise, and he's trying to prove to Captain Picard, he's like, no, I am powerless. This is my punishment. You know, this is, I'm powerless. They took my powers away, the Q continuum. And how can I prove it to you? And Worf, the Klingon, blurts out, how can I prove it to you, Captain Picard? Worf blurts out, die. They say, like, Worf, die. And it's it's like cringeworthy. It doesn't work like the, the scene. Like, it's just kind of stupid. But I give them props for presenting it like that because exactly right. You know, how do you how are you going to prove your powerless? Prove it to Captain Picard, but in this case it's like prove it to yourself. Die, Worf says. Yeah. And, it, and then he believes he's dying. He's actually falling asleep. He, this this being has never fallen asleep before. He he says oh, it was a terrifying experience. I was I lost consciousness. He's like, don't worry, you're just going to sleep. You don't even know what that's like. You've never been in a in a real body before. That this is a huge truth drop metaphor of exactly what we're going through. The scene again is is not pulled off exactly right. It's a bit cringe worthy, but. It's, you know, it's just another, how many examples do we need to come to these conclusions? And these conclusions are reinforced over and over and over again. Now, in the show, Q um, gets his powers back, but he's when he's facing death and looking death in the face, and he's going to commit a selfless act on behalf of helping or saving others, uh, he gets his powers back. Hey, you were going to commit a selfless act. We didn't think you had it in you. You're restored you got all your powers back. Does that mean the Star Trek episode needs to be taken literally and we need to perform that one major selfless act to win and escape? No, I, I don't think so. I don't think we have to throw ourselves and, you know, 50-50 chance we die, throw ourselves in front of the bus to save the little old lady, 50-50 chance we get splatted across the windshield to do something like that to get out of here. I don't think so. I don't think so, even if you want to take the Star Trek episode as a literal truth drop. I think it's like the person who carries himself or herself in a certain fashion who would be willing to do such a thing. Like, you know, that same thing you've heard millions of times, like service to – or you decide to be service to self, service to others. How many times have we heard, heard that stuff? But like aligning yourself in a certain way. The act itself isn't as important as the frequency – You've tuned yourself to, you know, the stock of what you made yourself into is more important than the act itself, which may never present itself. You know, in the parole here, hearing read from Shawshank brought a different self. He brought a completely different self to the last parole board hearing. And even the, the stamp of reject across his forehead, the ink hadn't even worn off it in 10 years. It still said rejected across his forehead. He's, he soaped it up daily, couldn't get rid of it, but he brought a different self to the third meeting, and they went, well, we don't know what this entity is, but we don't recognize it. Get him out of here. Parole him. But he's statistics show he's capable of committing another violent act tomorrow. We don't care. Parole him and get him out of here. We know reality is far closer to a dream or something like a dream combined with the Matrix than anything real that authority says it, it is or what we thought it was when we were in college. I mean, we, it's so, we've moved so far down the scale. The senses, you know, what the senses are designed to do is obvious. Not, oh, Matt, they're designed for survival. No, they're not. The senses are designed to make this show real. That's all. And so, so to make this show so it's believed in. That's all. The, that's what the senses are for, and particularly why they're so limiting. Again, for it, the reality to accomplish its goal and hide you from your true nature, hide you from your spiritual self, your spiritual aspect, and viewing the world, hide you from viewing the world from that second perception, as we said, it must be taken seriously and believed in. The senses weren't designed for survival, like Darwin says. They were designed so you'd believe in this world's bullshit. And if it wasn't so good at its illusion, you wouldn't take it seriously. 
You know, it's the reason blow up dolls don't work. Think about it. Think blow up dolls don't work. I mean, as much as you paid for that thing, think about the sharp edges on the hand. You know, this is not believable. All right? Even real dolls not believable. It, you have to believe it, you have to be fully immersed into it. And then to get something out of it, it has to be believed in. It just came to me. There was a movie with that actor from The Notebook, whatever his name is, it Ryan something. Um and he it was about he fell in love. He ordered this real girl doll. You know, however, whatever they're like five hundred dollars. It's you know, you know what it's for. But he falls in love with it, and he like believes it's real. And his sister, the psychiatrist, says to his sister, "Now, at first, you need to." He'll bring the doll in and talk to it like it's real. And you need to also pretend it's real. You can't crash his psyche. Anyway, the point, the the, the concept of the movie was brilliant, but it really went bad quickly. And I don't know how it went so bad. I mean, think to the scenarios. I mean. That if you know me and Greg book me and Greg into a room, we could come up with so many funny scenarios. Give me access to a thirty million dollar budget or fifty million dollar budget. This guy from the Notebook, professional camera crews. Oh my goodness, the things we could have done with this movie. That it just was really disappointing. I mean, it just endless the amount of things. And I, I just, I don't know. It's almost like it, it was. It's almost. Like it was made bad on purpose because there's just so many funny things you could do with that scenario. Sorry, guys. Let's get back to the point. Of course, most people can't sidestep the reality that the senses are telling them is all around them and how real it is. It's very believable, of course, to almost everyone. You know, only we, again, see the glitches, the gematria, the impossible coincidences, the synchronicities, common sense breakdowns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, so I was thinking perhaps... What the third eye means or opening the third eye means uh, to most people in this reality is getting back to the first sentence of this presentation. Third eye means potentially the perspective you carry, that third person perspective versus first person. Maybe it's possible for some people, as Levette's talked about and others, to completely open it. But that's got to be rare. It's not, it's not going to be expected in this reality that we need to completely open whatever is called uh, the third eye perception to win. Or you know, It's just not going to happen for most people. And I don't think it has to happen. We must, whatever the third eye perception is, we have a bit of it open or we wouldn't see the clown show that we see. But I think it's probably more healthy n not to shoot for the stars and say it must be opened. But just think of when, when you think of third eye, think of that second perception. You know, you, you have the ability to carry that third person perception on the human experience, um, which is, you know, that's just, you know, going halfway. I don't, I don't think it's going to completely open up and I'll be able to have Superman vision or something before I die. And I don't think that's necessary in this life. I think we should keep working towards it. But I think that experience, uh, which is rare, um, that happened in some, is not, is not going to happen for most of us. This needs to be part of the half page, how we talked recently about uh, go, at, go to bed at night. There's a dream. We wake in the, quote, real world, and then there's a lot of theories about after death, like Tibetan Book of the Dead, that another dream happens, and you be, have to see through that that experience is a dream. We know the experience in bed was a dream, so it would make sense that the middle experience, the, the meat inside the sandwich is also some kind of dream. That's not really a stretch when you look at it that way. So we've talked about that a lot recently, and of course the dream, the perspective of the jumps forward, the dream seems foggy when comparing it to the waking world. And to me, then probably the same ratio probably applies from death looking back on this reality. It'll probably seem foggy foggy in the exact same relationship that our reality now, the dream appears to us now. And it even this reality even seems foggy to us when we're awake in it. You know, what'd you have for lunch two days ago? Do you, I mean, do you, it just all comes and goes. The now moment seems clear, but... You know, I, I would like I'll, – I'll watch a video of Belle, my cat that died, um, I don't know what it was, three or four years ago, Belle. And I'll be like, oh my gosh, I remember – now I see the video. I remember doing that with Belle and I – but it's completely gone. Now luckily the video exists to jog my memory. Then the memories come back. But this, this reality, as clear as it seems, is so foggy. And I'm just saying the ratio and perspectives are probably the same between – the dream in bed, this reality, death. And why would I assume death is the – that's probably not the final. There's probably more steps above that. I just have to assume that. 
you know, gets back to Wizard of Oz. Dorothy was hit on the head and close to death. You know, hit on the head by, what is it, the shutters flew off the wall or whatever. So in her NDO or near-death experience or whatever, in the world of yellow bricks, that became what, it, what happened. It became crystal clear and vibrant. I mean, that must have been so amazing to see that for the first time in the 30s. So then her old real world, looking back on it, was this black and white foggy farm. But she didn't notice it was all black and white foggy, only from the perspective of looking back on it from the yellow bricks. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. <laughs> Sorry. Although the now moment seems clear to us while we're alive in it, you know, it's likely, again, from the ratio moving up or, or through death or whatever, that this experience is likely very foggy. And again, when you, when you even think about it or what you did yesterday, it's still foggy even while we're in it. Taking in this life experience through the senses while we're in the now moment seems clear and vibrant because we have nothing to compare it with. The comparison of Dorothy on the yellow bricks looking back at the old uh, grayed out sepia tones um, world that she had come from. We have nothing to compare it to. You know, an Eskimo for the first time they get this they get this hot tub. We're given to give this Eskimo this Eskimo a hot tub. And it's just 50 degrees in there. You know how cold it would be if you got into a tub 50 degrees? I mean, it would, you wouldn't, you'd almost get hypothermia, start to get sick. You put an Eskimo in that and you just tell him it's a real jacuzzi, jacuzzi, jacuzzi tub plugged in. He'd believe it. He has no, nothing to compare it to. The Eskimo thinks a 50 degree jacuzzi is like, oh man, this is incredible. It's getting hot in here. It's all about what we have uh, to compare it to. And in, in, ter- in terms of this, re- one of the ways this reality plays its tricks so successfully is we have nothing else via the mind wipe to compare it to. So who knows what happens upon death? You might say, oh, I thought, wow, I thought life down on earth was clear. And I thought I was completely lucid while I was down there. That's the same thing when you have a, wake up from a dream. I thought, you know, you don't, in your, when you're in the dream, you're like, this isn't very clear. This sucks. It's like all you know. So the same ratio, real life to dream, death to real life. I thought I was completely lucid while I was down there. But on Earth, when I lived down there on Earth, I was foggier than a stone turtle. I see that now upon death. So each layer up may be like cleaning mud off your goggles. Or each layer, it doesn't mean up, or towards um, original spiritual self or wherever your higher self wants to, to lead you, whatever your, your preferred direction may be. I mean, we've been bred into us down means towards hell or the abyss or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But each level, um, you know, is like clearing the go- the mud off the goggles and you didn't know they were dirty in the first place. But then why do I assume, you know, one of the, um, Tony who c- communicated with me about, about many things is, he uh, it seemed to, well, he didn't imply it. He said it in, in many different ways, like just, okay, you're at death. You think, oh, that's the final place. No, that's that's just probably another layer or or, or potentially trick that you manifested on yourself. It's going to appear that it's the final, oh, I'm out of earth. I'm finally in heaven or the final place. He's like, no, 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 that that's that you might manifest that upon yourself. That's not the, you have to make sure you don't get stuck and how many levels may there be, in other words. Another example in all this that I like to use, what the waking world is to the dream, potentially deaf to this world, how foggy it looks, or the perspective of looking upon something with a new perspective. What happens when you go to buy new shoes? You know, you don't, when you put those new shoes on, and then you pick up your old shoes and put them in, the box, you have no idea, or I don't want to speak for you, but we have no idea how shitty those old shoes were until we buy the new ones. I mean, like, oh my, I was wearing that. It just, it's a whole new perspective that you did not have on those shoes. And are you equating life, the life experience <laughs> to, to putting old shoes in a box? Yes. Yes, I am. Now, once reality has fooled most people, and that's 99.999 or whatever, that everything here is real, then it can really stay. See, it does that, I guess, in the first 10 years of life. Everything's completely real, but then it can really start to work real people over like an Asian masseuse with giant Mr. T arms. It can really start to get to you then once you believe in it all. The reality then 
takes you and puts you in difficult and harsh situations. It ushers into your life struggle and suffering and loss and anxiety and worry and stress and challenges. It laces on with your emotions, ties it on to you (laughs) with Jacob Marley chains. Oh, it'll really put the masseuse with Mr. T arms to you. (laughs) And what you need to do, it's so simple to overcome it and put it all into the right perspective. Perspective two, the Sim is in the, is in the Sims game with the Zynga cows running by and the meat's burning in the Sims game. If, but if you're seeing it as a Sims game or you're, the, you're holding the controllers, do you really give a shit if your Sim is burning the meat? No. See it that way. It's, it doesn't deserve to be seen any different. It just doesn't. You know, but there's a, and then every single movie and every single play, there always has to be a bad guy, right? Every uh, protagonist and antagonist. It just it's a basic first grade themes. There's a group here, a group of assholes. They're here in this reality to deliver this part of the play, enact whatever. They're here to deliver this pain. This is their role. The role from all the different minions, from Boris Johnson to Boris and Natasha and everybody in between, Melvin P., they play a role. Whether they're real, spiritually degraded, you created them out of your own mind, it doesn't matter that they play a necessary role as this reality system was designed. They really shouldn't be hated. Okay, I, I guarantee you that real dark parts want that. They, they, it wants to be hated. Just look at the presentation of Melvin P., Whatever that thing is, whatever, if it's in the human avatar or not, it presents itself and is told to present itself, so it is hated. So don't give it what it wants. Keep your energy. I mean, we should learn that a long time ago. We can benefit from these jerks. It's up to you. This reality serves up 10 different things at the same time. You can win, take what it gives you to win. You can, you can follow the trick and take what it gives you to flush yourself and lose. I know to the non, no consequences people rising up, that, that sounds like a consequence. I, I hear you, and I'm on the fence, but I, you keep running into these same themes, and they're hard to work through, no consequences people. And I can hear the no consequences people rising up, and, and you're right. You're right. Matt, stop teaching people that there are consequences because they'll manifest that upon themselves. First of all, I don't remember a video or two back. I don't teach anybody anything. I talk about a, a variety of different things that might not be readily apparent to your thinking mind, but you already know the answer. It's like, oh, yeah, that's right. Things I've said in this presentation, your inner knowing comes forth immediately Many, so it's not all going to be right, but your inner knowing will say, yeah, Matt's, Matt's, he's off on that. Other parts of this presentation, I guarantee you're like, yeah, that's right. Your inner knowing will just tell you. I'm not, I'm not teaching anybody anything. But the no consequences people would agree with the way, say, Tony presents karma. Like the whole notion, he would say, of karma is a complete Jacob Marley chain to get you – to tell your higher self that oh, I didn't do the right thing or I need to do more work or I need to do it again or I have this weight on me and I'm not the, – the whole notion of karma is – could potentially be a gigantic trick of this reality system to apply weights onto your back and Jacob Marley chains. If you b- uh, truly believe – and I, I'm on a fence. I don't know. You know this. I don't have all the answers right now. If you truly believe that karma just simply doesn't exist and is a trick of this reality, then there, it's like potentially there are chains that just disappear. You know, um, again, it's it's a little beyond um, my understanding at this point, but it's worth uh, leaving on the table, and I'll continue to discuss it. And back to one of the main points from uh, just a minute or two ago. If you're doing what the dark or the hijacked part of this reality wants the average person to do. Worry about this. Stress about this. Anxiety over this. Oh, the water the water bill's late. They're going to shut us off. All this stuff. If you're playing into it, every single way it wants you to play into it, not only does it hide you from ever understanding your true nature, it also does that with, with busyness, keeping people artificially busy from the moment they wake up until they go to bed. The amount of busy busyness that this reality is able to crank up now is unnatural. I'll talk about this in a whole separate video sometime. I, I should have way more free time than I do here. Just little chores just take forever. 
it, there's something I believe the re, I really believe the reality has changed or or morphed. I believe it. I believe it morphs every day um, in a lot of different ways, related in some way to the Mandela effect. But it's unnatural. You know, sometimes I'm like, it's now seven o'clock, and I still can't relax. And I just what it's just. What if I had five kids? Or what if I had this and that? It's like it's unnatural. It shouldn't bog me down, and I'm sure it just bogs everybody down the same in the same way. But the point is, if everybody's so busy, then they the reality has successfully hidden somebody from ever understanding who they truly are because they don't ever have a, a moment to even ponder who they who they really are. Do they even have a time to pour Calgon in the seventies and early eighties? Calgon, take me away! You pour this this shit into a bathtub. Is the only the only um, break you get from the screaming kids, Calgon, take me away. And, and then you're so damn tired, you just kind of fall asleep and drift off under the water. You don't, you can't ponder. You have the mental um, capacity to ponder the big issues of who you really are after being busy all day. So that's just the. It just plays the same games over and over again. But and, and you can't, you can't use the. Re- if you're busy all day long, you can't use the reality. Um, for what it really is for, in terms of spiritual progression. Now, if it's gonna if it's gonna be harsh and it's gonna teach about loss and it's, I mean, you are you are you stressed about how harsh it is, or, or are you transmuting it and learning from it? Um, Robert De Niro in the movie Cape Fear. I mean, that you know, one of the all time really scary villains of all time, uh, Robert De Niro. I don't like him. He's a creep. I'll give credit where credit's due in Cape Fear. Um, who played Daniel Day-Lewis as Bill Cutting in Gangs of New York? Some of the all-time scariest uh, dudes in any any movie. But Robert De Niro in Cape Fear is a counselor. Counselor, you're going to learn about loss. That's not too good. Counselor, you're going to learn about loss. Gonna, what? Did you kill my dog? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, counselor, you're going to learn about loss. De Niro, maybe he's a metaphor for reality itself. You know, it's your all confident spirit. I've got to incarnate into a womb, into a what? A womb. You're going to be put into a a woo woo womb, and you woo woo woo. No, a womb, and you get all confident and shit. Ah, it's not that earth. How hard can that be? No, spirit, grasshopper. You're going to learn about loss. Now we are going to learn about loss and difficult things here, but are we? You know, it sounds like a cliche. We've heard it over and over again. It sounds trite. Oh, you need to use it. Um, it is one of the base foundation stones of this reality. You have to use it. You have to use it. You know, there's no doubt about that. In my opinion, we have to be reminded of that. Even it sounds like, well, Matt, you're not the first to say that. I know it's a cliche, but 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 you know. These cliches exist for a reason. <laughs> Stereotypes exist for a reason. There's a lot of truth in them. And also, as you were overconfident about to enter the womb, maybe you got this pep talk. Like, you're going to completely believe, or at least you'll flip-flop, and you will be scared of this in that existence, that you have will have no more existence. That this little, tiny blip of a reality, you will... At least at a certain time in your life, you will believe that this is potentially all there is, and your entire existence will be snuffed out. You'll as soon as you uh, say come into your teenage years, you might start thinking about this thing, and it'll scare the crap out of you for a long time. Then you'll be like, "Get the heck out of here!" N- like knowing who you are, you're like that's there's no way I'm going to worry about my existence. You know, it's like oh, after just I just I just spent. 47 million years at a ski lodge, and then I did this at the reality system. I did that, and I did all. Who knows what we did before coming into the com- – book us you – know, maybe that's why Schwarzenegger said it that way in Pumping Iron. Book us into a room. It sounds like book us into a womb. Maybe that's what it's all about. i got to go watch that. I'm going to present that segment of Pumping Iron, guys, so you know. But they'll probably – just for that three-second spot, they'll probably copyright strike me. They might copyright strike me for me just imitating it right now. Where does, where does the, the – the, Barriers of real copyright protection and fair use begin and end, but um, they'd be like, "You're gonna, you're gonna actually believe that your existence has come to an end, and you'd be all overconfident as a spirit." Like, no way. So you know, that's the way. You know, that perspective number two. Always operate at a perspective number two. Don't tattoo it across your forehead. But maybe put a little uh, a little trinket on your keychain or something. Something to continue to remind you to operate out of perspective number two. 
as I've uh, mentioned in the past, to use this life as it's intended. I don't think our type of spiritual incarnation has to understand all these complicated esoteric and occult mysticism, tomes and texts and all that mumbo jumbo that keeps popping up as we do our research. It seems like, you know, with the certain elements of the creeps and some of the dark occulted things they're into or some of the tomes of of certain societies and all that and whatever the theosophical society is and all that all that stuff it seems like they for some maybe they need that to have their reality buttons and levers but our level of spiritual incarnation i'm very confident of this and in, in, in my own act i mean do what you want but i don't i'm not you hand me these these books or well that levette tried to put all of this stuff on that thumb drive and she's trying to do the right thing and, and hold on to information that was being scrubbed off the internet. Matt, if it wasn't important, why would it be scrubbed off the internet? I, I Look, d- decide for yourself. I don't think we need any of that. At least our level of spiritual incarnation, real people, you don't need any of that. There's no book that's going to give you the answer. If I only had that book or if I only had that secret information that they keep from me, oh, bull crap. Absolute bull crap. In fact, I think it's the opposite. The more you search for it and comb through these that these these ancient tomes and esoteric writings it's just bog it's just bog what we need to do here for ourselves at least for us i don't know what this incarnation is or the melvin p incarnation or if npcs exist what we need to do for us is very simple when you cut through all these presentations here it's very simple it's reality is a gigantic trick what what part's a trick every part's a trick it's here to hide us from our true nature and walking around the world with perspective number two, which I believe we carry right through the moment of death. And it, there won't be no tricks. There won't be no Saturn moon matrix. They'd be able to gobble the Saturn moon matrix up and spit it out like like spit and chew, uh, skull tobacco. On the, who knows? How, th- there's a reason they play these tricks. If we don't fall for them, we can use this reality system to increase, for lack of better words, our power. I believe this. I mean, and all of reality gives itself away that this is actually what's happening to me. But as usual, the reality has a custom-made bog for each participant. And each participant, it and, and the custom-made bog for people that pursue truth is, oh, there's something out there that I need to go research. There's something, and instead of just looking and finding your inner knowing and saying, I'm not going to fall for this trick. I'm going to see who I really am. Oh, there's something in this book or this. Come on, give me a break. Give me a break. It's, it, it's a custom made conspiracy or a custom made breadcrumb line with yellow uh, tinting around the top for every single person. I forget who wrote this to me, but one of the great all time great lines in conspiracy reality research is, the more you jump into conspiracy, into at least the details of it, the farther you take yourself away from truth. This is a better way of saying, or what, what I uh, adopted, uh, which is the bog, okay? But that person said it better than I ever did. Keep diving into conspiracy, and it's every, every bit of your inner knowing and everybody listening to this going, that is absolutely true, so what will you do? Are you going to go jump on conspiracy ch- channels, YouTube channels, and investigate if Justin <laughs> Justin Trudeau is actually a Castro? That, that, give me a break. I mean, are you kidding me? What an absolute joke that people we, – we in this community, at least right here, can't see that that is part of the general reality trick. It's a custom-made flavor for each person. The, the high-thinking conspiracy person that sees something's not right in the world, it will then open up the, – remember the elevator example? Um, open up door number uh, – the door to floor 15 or floor 17. Oh, my goodness. What's here is never talked about on the evening news with Greasy Plastic Man. So this has got to be the top floor. But the it's push. – you're actually moving farther away from truth. <laughs> it's so obvious. Anyway, sorry, guys. Um if it's so simple, Matt, Matt, why is your presentation so goddamn long? I don't know. We gotta have fun with it too. What are we gonna do all day today? Watch the uh, watch the Xfinity racers and NASCAR g- go for the pole position. Like, what the hell is she gonna do? The reality is fluid and far more customized to each person and what they 
will chase or be willing to chase than the people realize. Think, oh, we're, I'm just going to go out into reality and investigate. It's all objective. No, no. It's customizing its ass for each individual that pays it attention in different ways. The bog I'm saying the bog. What what Gus is saying here? Like, what Gus? Is, it's not about monkey. It's about what Gus is saying here is the bog can morph into your flavor, your favorite flavor of ice cream. And oh, I like a uh, mint chip, and it gives you a mint chip. Oh, I like chocolate with some sherbet on top, and oh, it gives you that. But you know what it is? You're you're actually just seeing it falsely through your senses. It's it's yellow soaked scoops. It's yellow soaked scoops. You know what I mean? That you think is your favorite ice cream. It's it's a master at this game. Don't even take the damn cone. Just as it's about to hand it to you, just move your hand and let it drop on the floor. That might be a, another violation in certain jurisdictions of Germany where you can only take you can only take 3 licks on premises during the during the whole the height of the sea thing. If you were in certain jurisdictions in Germany, probably just above Bavaria, if you took more than 3 licks, you could be thrown not thrown into jail, but probably fined. You needed to take you you can take 3 licks when that damn cone is handed to you, but then you need to get your ass off premises to continue to lick. Now if that by itself doesn't give itself – the whole reality is broken down, that there's nothing else you need to know than the three-lick rule um, regarding ice cream and C-19 in Germany. That's all we, we need. One, one example? Yeah, one example. We have what? We have 10,000 more if we need them. We're finally starting to learn our lesson in this regard. Oh, there's this – oh, this new conspiracy has presented itself, and mud flood just came out of the blue. <laughs> there was no evidence whatsoever the last 150 years. That any, we just we – just, somebody was brilliant enough to, to latch onto that, and Tartaria just came out of the blue. Well, where were all these Tartarian – Tartarista maps 10 or 15 years ago? Where It's almost like – interesting. These crazies, conspiracy people almost make it seem like the reality itself is doing this. Who would be dumb enough – to think that after we have 10,000 examples of how it just kind of creates conspiracy out of the blue and impossible linkages and connections between the conspiracy. So we're finally starting to – we, maybe in this little group, we're finally starting to see it as the stinky bog. Oh, that's just – don't go in there. That's the stinky bog. You know, but still most truth seekers, we see the stinky bog and they think – They've won the golden ticket, and they're actually about to jump in and swim in Willy Wonka's Chocolate River. We, we it's chocolate, all right, but it ain't that chocolate. We we're there's not even in the truth community. There's only uh, there's only a few of us that are that are seeing through this endless conspiracy, unnatural laying of breadcrumbs. All right, now this applies even more the way they follow the breadcrumbs more to truthers and how fooled this community has been than to any other group. On Earth, the reality, as I've said, is the event horizon. It will show you what you want and pulls you away <clears throat> from basic truth. I call it the event horizon blue origin. The event horizon on its trip at the speed of light to Alpha Centauri, whatever, using a black hole uh, core, that did a whole lot more <laughs> than the blue origin. But I'm going to combine the water heater with the event horizon and call it in the future the uh, event horizon blue origin hot water heater. Go looking for something and start investigating something with fascination. And I'm just going to eh, make a bet here. I don't know what's going to happen, but I bet it'll show you and lay breadcrumbs and show you kind of exactly what you want to find every single time. No real world could do that. How come these other truth channels don't talk about how fake the world is in this regard? I mean... <sighs> I'd turn them off. I mean, if you can't see it by now, it's so obvious that this is so unnatural. And the truth community thinks that secret societies is still running around doing everything. Give me a break. Matt, you always say that. You're probably just trying to protect the secret society. You're probably one of them. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I'm one of them. Yeah. I'm trying to – yeah. Uh, I'm tr by pointing out that no, no group of people could pull all this off. No, there's so much impossible conspiracy and links and ties between and amongst the conspiracy. Men and women that eat their sandwiches and sit down on the you-know-what, they couldn't even pull off one one-thousandth of what is being delivered. Not – you can't – it's ridiculous. The, the argument that they couldn't pull it all off – they couldn't – I could make the argument go, going up against somebody at a podium or if we had booked ourselves into a room that they couldn't even pull off one one-thousandth 
fa- – I can't even say it – of the damn shit that we've seen. Oh, and, and it's always pulled off perfectly so the masses believe it. They never make a big mistake and the pendulum never swings back the other way. Well, that's, that's going to happen in the real world. So when I talked about the elevator going up and away from truth at a maximum of 20 doors, there is no maximum floors, 20 doors, 20 floors. There is no ma- – it will go up forever as long as you want to keep riding the elevator up to each – and each layer of conspiracy, you, you don't learn a damn thing about what's important. You learn a ton about the, the trivial little topic that you're investigating that reality is happy to keep you distracted with for your entire life. And it's just graduated animal farms and elevator doors that are perfectly positioned for each person that's investigated, giving you your favorite flavor of ice cream so you move farther and farther away from truth. In this case, farther is right because we're using the analogy of the elevator, which is moving its position. If without the elevator, I'd have to say further. Oh, use further when it's not actually moving you know, from point A to point B. If it's actually moving across the splat turf, then you use far, farther. That's the difference between farther and further. I think the best way to understand this Earth reality system, or at least the, the hijack side or what we call the dark side, is to think of it as one thing, one collective whether you want to say entity or it has its own sentience at the screen level or not, it's best all its systems and all its components and levers think of as one thing, working together as a system to accomplish its goal, which again, it's the same thing every time, to fool, <laughs> trick, and deceive a real being like you and me so it goes through the earth realm and their earth life without understanding itself and what it's really here to do for itself. It comes back to the same sentence every single time. Almost everything outside of ourselves in terms of what we call society, culture, governments, its systems and subsystems, I mean, it all works toward that single goal as a collective without each part or any part or any particular minion understanding how it's serving the whole. I mean, it's pretty simple at this point if you can back up far enough and see it. Your goal is simple, to become lucid and more lucid as time goes on, and aware of the trick, which we already are, but then become aware of who you truly are from the big picture perspective. Once again, it gets back to the beginning of this presentation, perspective one, perspective two. Perspective one being looking through the eyes of the sim game and believing first and foremost uh, what you are is exactly what (laughs) people like Tony Robbins say you are, or are you looking from perspective number two, from the higher perspective, the third person perspective, the six feet above perspective, looking down as something more connect- connected with your spiritual self, etc. Okay, goal reality is to make the important notions or these breakthrough understandings that may come during the course of some human lives to first of all to hide all of them from people, but then to make them foggy so people, if they start to understand certain things, to immediately pull them off into the wrong direction, which is the purpose for unlimited and forever um, graduated animal farms, esoteric texts, things that will lead people on an endless chase so they'll really never figure out the most simple truths before they die. And the most important root truths are extremely simple. As I've said, anybody that presents it as complicated Uh, in YouTube or whatever, I would immediately turn them off. If you want to believe I'm turning them off because I'm too dumb to understand them, believe that. It's not complicated. The, The reality gives itself away and presents itself as so complicated, which tells you it's simple. The mind fuckery and the brainwashing starts so early in life, like a first grader is in a classroom. The teacher doesn't know what he or she's doing, just trying to do the best they can. They've been brainwashed. They're operating on a set of lies given to them. The person that presented the lies to your first grade teacher is operating on a set of lies presented to them. And like the shampoo commercial from the 70s and so on and so on and so on. These bastards just had to put a lie out or a series of lies a long time ago and then just they perpetuate themselves. They, they build domino lines on themselves, and, and people are uh, complicit in doing that for them. So right in, in first grade, the teachers say, um, who in class knows what they want to be? 
when they grow up. It, the mind fuckery starts that early. And then every single one of the little bastards in class is programmed, programmed to spit out something that is in some way makes ties and contracts with the system or with this place or with the earth reality system. And I want to be a policeman. I want to be a firefighter. I want to be an astronaut. And some, some of their employment objectives are more nefarious than other. One little geek in the back of the class was like, I want to be a banker. And the teacher's like, oh, that is so honorable. Everybody in class wants to serve their fellow man. But imagine if one, just there's probably one classroom somewhere where some little kid said, I watched, uh, my parents didn't let me, but I watched, uh, they rented Boogie Nights and I want to do what he did. I want to keep making films. It's not, people think this is dirty. It's he starts becoming Dirk Diggler in the classroom. People think this profession is dirty. It's not dirty. And he's like, Joey, sit down. Don't talk about those things. You shouldn't be watching Boogie Nights at your age. Don't. I'm no longer Joey. I want to be referred to as Brock Landers. It probably happened in the classroom somewhere. The last word on the creeps, uh, no matter what they are, uh, a, a figment or a creation of our own collective consciousness, they, they, whatever it is, they need – again, they really would need – I was going to say they need quantum reality generated beings and quantum ge generating people – um, of which the reality is based on consciousness, not a, it's not based on a big bang. Um, they need us to shape society and move culture and move the world in the direction that they, that they want. Well, Matt, it goes without saying, if they themselves are a created by the own or the dark side of the collective conscious, and they wouldn't even exist if we didn't create them, they would need us to, to not only to live, to move the world. So we, we don't know exactly where the chips fall there, but just returning to the absolute basics, they need us. They need us, I believe, as some sort of reality generator beings to shape the world in a way that they can't do themselves. Another way to put it, I doubt they can turn the car left or right without us being the chauffeur. Now, who knows what higher being or aspect of you even, that created this whole Earth experience, that created the game board here. Um, the creeps play on the game board. They're not that powerful. They didn't create the game board. I think they understand certain things with reality buttons and levers, and they, they play on the board. But they can't move the pieces around on their own uh, without us, without real people, how many ever real people there are here. They need to fool the real people, or you could say they need to fool the collective conscious of potentially many millions of generator beings to make the ice sculpture that they want. They can't pick up the chainsaw and do it themselves. They need us to do it for them. And unfortunately, what we carve for them, what, what, what society has been carving for them in the ice sculpture, you know, we want a pretty bird or a big swan. And, it, you know, we've, too many people are working for what they want. We en it ends up being a gigantic, ugly phallus. Then they have their little cocktail parties around the ice sculpture. They're having their, their – Jared's coming to serve. He's, he's serving more – I got more hots coming up, more pigs in the blanket, and they're, they're around the ice sculpture. It's some gigantic Godzilla dick. And it's like you got the – you got the – you fooled the real people into making this gigantic Godzilla dick. We can't do it ourselves. Yeah, we have to get the real people to make the ice sculpture for us. What if the people realize that they can – make whatever ice sculpture they want and they have the power to to actually put something beautiful where the Godzilla dick is and he, well that's it keep your voice down if they ever realize they can carve the sculpture the way they want we're really in trouble how do you guys get the real people here and the real generator beings to carve whatever ice sculpture you want every single time well first and foremost we get them to believe that the world that we laid out for them is real and then we harness their energy, emotion, stress, worry. They believe every bit of it. It's beautiful. And then we reap the rewards. I mean, some of these people are so fooled that we we put Bon Jovi out there again. He's only on his 52nd tour. The Rolling Stones are on their 4,000th tour. We put Bon Jovi out again on a comeback tour. And look at the subset of population down here. They're excited for free tickets given away on the radio for a Bon Jovi comeback tour. I mean, what 
is it possible we could spiritually degrade that group any further? Oh, oh yeah, they say, oh, we're working on it. We're working on it. Absolutely. I mean, winning free tickets, people, people get excited about that. Winning free tickets to a Bon Jovi comeback tour is basically like winning my dried turd in a cookie tin. I've equated the reality trick to getting in an elevator and the elevator floors go up. It's very similar to the graduated animal farms. Level one is the um, ABC World News with Plastic Man, and most people believe everything there. But some people get uncomfortable. Not uncomfortable. They get restless, and they say there's got to be more to it. So they say this elevator goes up to another floor, doesn't it? And they take the – and then the reality is laid out at each floor exactly what they need to keep them satisfied. There's a floor with Alex Jones and there's a floor of, with um, Glenn Beck and all of the gr lower graduated animal farms. And then it gets higher up and you get into um, esoteric works and occultism and all that, which to me is, is, is the bog of just, just still hiding you from yourself, uh, dangling the carrot that the answer is out there somewhere. And you just keep going up and up forever in this uh, this false pursuit of an answer that someday you're going to get out on the right floor and you're going to be given the answer and magically rise up <laughs> as an enlightened being. The whole elevator ride is completely false. The creeps, the dark reality has most people completely figured out. I mean, everybody's parting on the ship of fools and the river of insanity, whatever... The horse of a different color becomes the people just go along with it. Where they have to be more cunning is with people, people like you and people like me, people that have dived off the ship. Or I guess if you're completely dived off the ship, you're kind of where we are. But there's people that are – think of Jack trying to talk Rose down from hanging over the railing or whatever. She's up on the railing going, there's got to be more to it than this. Something's not right. Where they have to be more cunning is with people that could evolve into people like you and people like me and people that could evolve – uh, you know, Rose is hanging up on the balcony. That, to me, that's a metaphor, not for her wanting to to kill herself and get away from Billy Zane, but to jump off the ship of fools and to actually swim to the bank and, and come upon real human truth. That's the way I'm going to see it every time I watch that movie, and that's about once a week for me. But it's the, it's it has to be more cunning with people that eventually might have a chance of understanding themselves. So they stock, again, the same favorite flavors of ice cream – but in this case, it's an elevator example. Floors 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Oh, the highest level truths must be here. Oh, my gosh. Jack and Rose, let's get off on floor uh, 18. And that, look, there's this thing nobody's ever heard of. This This is the Phil Theosophical Society. And look at this. There's 87,000 hours of Manly P. Hall lectures. Oh, we found the answer here. And the reality is like... Yeah, get deeper and deeper into my bog. It opens the doors up to these smart people and intellectuals. And these people being so far above the masses who are down on floor one and their perpetual – is a perpetual on floor one. It's a perpetual Black Friday taking place. And some real people on the bottom floor, again, they get restless. They get, There's got to be more to it. There has to be more answers to life than this. And does this elevator go up? And then it goes up to progressively more sophisticated and intelligent graduated animal farms. And when they get out on floor 8 or floor 10, it's like certainly these truths must be very close to final truths and investigating them for 20 years. And that pursuit has to be, quote, just and the right thing for smart people like me to do, taking years trying to understand the nature of the cabal and who exactly runs the world and listening to old Benjamin Fulford presentations about the White Hat Dragon Society. That, that's, that's a, that, at, least, at least I've left the ABC World News. That's got to be, quote, just and beneficial research, right? Nope. It's the same friggin' bog. <laughs> announcement, announcement. Floor 9, ladies' lingerie. Floor 10, what the queen really is and what the monarchy of this world is really involved in. Oh, Jack, wait, that's a just pursuit. Let's get out on floor 10. 
arriving at floor 10, what the queen really is and what the monarchy of this world is really involved in. Everything you'd like to know, step out here, about the control structure entity is on floor 10, including the complete inner workings of the Vatican Library and the Cabal. Oh, wow. Let's get out here, Jack. Look at this book. Look at it. Is she reptilian? Well, oh, look at this over here. This point of purchase display. What dark magic is she involved in in keeping herself alive like what Voldemort tactics maybe horcrux what really happened on in 2001 is in this tome what really hit the side of the pentacle look at this look at these aisles how much of history is a lie look at this aisle there's a big blue blinking neon that Tom Cruise used in cocktail blink blink blinkity blink that says Tartaria it's blinking you have to shield your eyes the neon is so bright but you want let's walk down it these are all, Jack, these are necessary and just pursuits. No, you got the elevator example by now. It's the bog. The creeps and the screen love this sort of pursuit because it creates energy that they suck from and it creates loops that reinforce their own power and position. In fact, it strengthens their position. Some people, as they go up and up the elevator, like, well, how many floors are there? It's what? Never it's never ending. Oh, this then a couple people will say this is some sort of Hunger Games bog or something. We got to get the hell. Does this the floor doesn't go down? Well, there's got to be a stairwell. So I'm going down. I'm getting off the entire elevator. You know, other people, they're real satisfied with their pursuit. Like, why are you jumping off this elevator? Don't you see this leads to real truth? Look, we're coming up. Announcement coming up to floor 15. Um, let's see what's here. Reading and understanding Hobbes' Leviathan and the collective works of Aristotle and other eclectic and esoteric and bullshit reading lists that get you nowhere. This and all these smart people investigating truth <laughs> jump out on that floor. And this will bring enlightenment and give me – this will provide me with some sort of spiritualism or it will give me the answers when – well, just look inside yourself, the biggest truth drop of all time from Silence of the Lambs. Look deep within yourself, Clarice. An absolute truth drop, perhaps the most important words ever said from a nefarious villain in any movie of all time. Look deep within yourself. The floors are simply reality distractions that match the intelligence or where the person is on their false pursuit of truth. Look, Jack, look how far the elevator goes. Look how much truth there is above the the bottom level bog of ABC, David Muir, Greasy Man presenting the same point of purchase items in a never ending Black Friday. Look, look at this floor 36 here says, what is Gnosticism? A five year pursuit of studying Gnosticism. Oh my God, we have to, should we get, if we have to get off here, it took five years. Well, surely the answer must be here. So let's get off and investigate. Okay. Point, if you're all said and done, well, all these people have pursued all these different floors. Tell them what they've won. Because they're looking for answers outside themselves. Tell them what they've won. They've won the ninth level of Metroid. Nothing. They've won absolutely Nothing. Well, they have won more confusion, but that's not really winning anything, is it? People rising up, getting all upset at me. What floor you present in, Matt, you son of a bitch? I'm presenting to get off the damn elevator and look inside yourself for simple answers. Does that sound like a shill and somebody that's working for secret groups or whatever? Everything I'm confused of? A very simple message to ignore it all, to get off the damn elevator. There, any, no floor, any, the, only winning move is not to play. The only winning perception when you ride the elevator for long enough, and most of us have been here 10 years, is you must assume that there is no floor on the damn elevator ride that's going to deliver an answer. Then you back up even more and say, nothing is going to deliver an answer out there. Is a book out there? Yeah. It ain't going to – anything out there is not going to deliver the answer. You might not believe it. I believe it. I say get off the elevator. The elevator is a constant promise of just go a little bit farther. It's a false promise that there's some sort of answer from intellectual text <laughs> and gurus. Now, I understand people falling for this in the truth pursuit four or five years, but we've been doing this long enough. Like, come on. We've seen enough. Nothing ever delivers. And then you look over the – there's actually some demented elevator 
operator, and I had to, one picture of a demented elevator operator that came to me. I put Brie Larson here. Brie Larson. Could you imagine a scarier elevator operator than Brie Larson, whatever – or whatever that I don't I'm not who she is what she is I don't know she scares the crap out of me this Brie Larson there is nothing that terrifies me more in a, in a literal nightmare than to be in a dream and I'm in naked and afraid literally in the show not with the vintage space chick I mean that would be very unpalatable but naked and afraid with Brie Larson could you imagine how scary that would be you would there's a one in three chance you couldn't you could not get out the other end of that show without your balls being ripped off. And I'm so mentally gone at this point, it's just getting stupid. So I'll I'll wrap it up, guys. I'm gonna do free voice, a uh, free voice video for tomorrow, freevoice.io. Um and um I just we'll just cl- close it with this. This is actually kind of funny, and then I'll a little brief summary. Um somebody when I st- remember I used to talk about the vintage space uh, girl and I used to joke how um, she, you know, I had to, I had to dump her. <laughs> you know, she people. I started, I have a joke about about we were in a relationship as obviously it was a joke. People, there was one particular woman that emailed me saying it really is not right <laughs> to talk about ex girlfriends like that. Like like I really dated the vintage space chick. Now there's no doubt in my my mind she re- she wants me. But I didn't really date her, obviously. That was a joke. As I, when I, I said she came down my driveway with the say anything, a boombox above her head with blaring out the your eyes, trying to get me to come. That didn't really happen. One woman emailed me thinking she was upset at me. Matt, as someone as nice as you shouldn't talk about your girl ex-girlfriends like that. What? I didn't really date the I – w- I wouldn't date her. I wouldn't even do Naked Afraid with her. Anyway, guys, it's very simple. Remember the two perspectives. Um, and at least start practicing the two perspectives when you're out in the world. I think that's the place to start when you're out in the world. And if you truly have a, adopt perspective number two, I really believe it's almost like an aura that comes uh, over you and across you. Like, you know, seeing yourself for who you really are, not playing this ridiculous earth game. I think people will start to look at you funny, like in a good way, like who is this powerful being that just walked into the, to the Walmart, you know? So in fact, Matt, it's like an oxymoron. If we become this powerful being and truly operate in perspective number two, we won't go into a Walmart. Exactly.